Hello, and welcome to the Find Creative Expression Podcast, conversations about art and creativity. I'm your host, Sarah Crawford, author, playwright, musician, basically obsessed with art. You can find more information at findcreativeexpression.com. Let's get rolling. Hey, everyone, and welcome to episode 26 of the Find Creative Expression podcast. Coming up a little later, I'm talking to Lainey Kennedy. Lainey is a playwright. She paints. She works with watercolor. She grew up playing violin. She's basically super creative and inspirational. So I'm excited to talk to her. So definitely stick around for that. So I'm continuing to be super creative. I got back into a writing workshop about a week ago, and I workshopped the first 15 pages of my novel, which was really helpful and gave me some great ideas. So I've been working on that. It's going kind of slowly, but, you know, I'm not giving myself any deadlines or anything, so I'm just trying to kind of enjoy the writing process. And, you know, I've pretty much just been working on that in my ataxia novel, but I randomly got an idea the other day about my vampire trilogy. So, you know, when things like that come up, I'll work on whatever it is. So the ataxia novel is kind of my main priority right now, but I'm also excited to finish the vampire trilogy eventually and finish the meditation retreat play. I got a lot of uh, ideas cooking. So I'm really just trying to stay open to inspiration. I have also been volunteering in the booth at my church, Unity North Atlanta, working the cameras. So they have three cameras. So basically what I'm doing is choosing which camera is showing on the stream. And then, you know, I'm also operating the cameras like with a joystick, like changing the angles and zooming and panning and, you know, all that fun stuff. I'm really having a blast with this. First of all, I really like doing behind the scenes kind of techie stuff. When we made the short film that I wrote, Leapfrog, In 2008, I was jumping in and helping, you know, any way I could. So one day I'd be holding the boom mic and the next day I would be, you know, making sure the set looked the way we wanted it to. And the next day I would be going out and getting pizza for everyone. So, you know, it makes me feel good to be helping my church with their live stream and helping them get out their services to everybody. And I'm also just really enjoying the process of, you know, working with the cameras. I'm still crocheting my blanket. I've actually been working on it like when I have Zoom calls or when I'm, you know, doing therapy or, you know, even doing the interviews for the podcast. I'm probably going to be working on it when I'm interviewing Lainey. I find that it's just kind of easier for me to, like, really listen to people when I'm doing something with my hands. Anyway, I'm a lot further along than I was the first few weeks last time I made a blanket. So, you know, maybe it won't take me three years after all. I have an idea for a painting that I think I'm going to try to work on this weekend. And that's kind of different for me because, you know, I have painted before, but when I've painted before, I kind of just have ideas as I'm doing it. Like, I've never sat down with an idea, okay, I'm going to paint this, you know. Oh, and I've been putting together a special podcast episode for next time. So in August, it will be one year that I've been doing this podcast. And I have had so many great conversations, so I'm going to be doing an episode where I just kind of reflect about all the conversations I've had in the last year, and I'm going to be weaving in clips. So if you've been listening to the podcast, but maybe you don't listen to every episode, you'll definitely want to check this one out because it's going to be like the best of the Find Creative Expression podcast. 
As far as what I've been into lately, I don't have a lot to report. My boyfriend, Sean, is a huge movie buff, and he always gets me to watch all sorts of movies. So we recently watched the 1978 Invasion of the Body Snatchers with Donald Sutherland, which is, you know, a classic. It was really entertaining, and it's always cool to see a film that so many other films have been influenced by. I have to say, the end totally surprised me, and it ended in a way that I did not expect. Sean also showed me the 2005 film Match Point, which is a Woody Allen film with Scarlett Johansson and Jonathan Rhys Myers. Now, I know Woody Allen is somewhat of a controversial person, but I have to say I really enjoyed this movie. It had, you know, a lot of twists and turns that I didn't see coming, and it also ended in a way that I really wasn't expecting. Let me just say, I like to learn as little as possible about the actual people that are creating the movies or books or music or anything that I'm consuming. That isn't always possible, I know. But if you really start digging into things these artists are doing or saying, I know I probably would find a lot of stuff about everyone that pisses me off or is offensive, especially like all of the dead white male writers from back in the day. So I'm a big fan of viewing a work of art just as its own thing and not attached to the person who created it. Because, you know, I think when you create a movie or a book or an album or whatever it is, the thing you've created now has a life of its own. So basically, I feel like the art transcends the artist. Now, I'm not going to be going out of my way to spend money to support people that I blatantly disagree with. I've never really looked up Uh, Woody Allen and his history. So everything I've heard has just been, you know, what I've heard other people say. But, you know, if somebody puts a movie on, like, I'm probably going to watch it. I mean, I don't know that I'm going to spend money to support people that have done bad things. Like, you know, I'm not going to run out and buy a Bill Cosby stand-up special or something. But if it was on, you know, I'm not going to, like, leave the room in a huff and be pissed off. Like, you know, I feel like a work of art should be judged on its own. So anyway, sorry for that little rant there. And that's just something I've been thinking about lately. So I've also been reading a lot and listening to a lot of audiobooks. And oh, my God, I just have to tell you about this. So I'm not going to say the name of the book, but I was listening to an audiobook and the main character receives a text message from this mysterious benefactor that you're not supposed to know who it is at this point in the story. So the narrator of the audiobook just stops narrating and says, hey, so um, usually I would do text messages in a character's voice, but There's a big reveal coming up, so I'm just going to do them in the main character's neutral voice instead. So now I thought I had an idea who the mysterious benefactor was at this point, but after that, I definitely (laughs) knew who it was. And this was just so incredibly bizarre to me. I listen to a ton of audiobooks, and I've never once heard a narrator stop and explain something, let alone basically give a spoiler. Someone pointed out to me that it was likely an editing error, like maybe it was just a note for whoever was doing the editing, and they just, like, forgot to take it out. But you would think Amazon would have someone that listens to a whole audiobook before it goes up. I mean, maybe not. But I mean, this 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 wasn't like an indie author. Like this was a book done by a publishing company. 
I mean, I, I think it was maybe like a, you know, a small press or something. I don't, I don't think it was like, you know, penguin or anything. But you would think that somebody would have listened to the whole thing and been like, oh, hey, maybe we need to take that out. And I mean, it was in like chapter three. So like, even if you don't, let's get through the whole thing. Like you would think someone would have at least got to that. There were at least two or three reviews on the first page of Audible that mentioned it. So if they didn't realize it before, they definitely should now. Anyway, this was easily the weirdest thing I've ever heard in an audiobook, and I just had to share it with y'all. All right, so I've been rambling long enough, so let's go ahead and get into the interview. Hey, everyone. I'm here with Lainey Kennedy. Uh, Lainey Kennedy is an artist and writer living in Cleveland, Georgia. She works with watercolor, pen, acrylics, and reclaimed and repurposed materials. And she sells bookmarks, stationery, and stickers on her Etsy store. While her main writing focus is playwriting, she also writes fiction, including micro and flash fiction. She grew up playing classical and Irish music on violin, and she creates craft goods with her husband. Welcome, Lainey. Hi. It's nice to be here. Yeah, thank, thanks for joining me for, you know, episode 26 of the Find Creative Expression podcast. So, so how did you get into writing? Well, I have this epic 32-page rambling thing I wrote in eighth grade, just sitting down at the computer and typing on it every day. Um, but I didn't really, like, get serious uh, yeah, I'll share that epic with you sometime, Sarah. It's uh-huh. um, amazing and all. It's middle school glory. <laughs> um, but playwriting, I didn't get into until college. Um, and in our theater program, we had a theater for young audiences program called Wonder Quest, which kids theater, bright colored sets, larger than life characters, you know, right. those were the productions out And Gay Hammond, who was the director, um, also wrote or adapted the scripts for the stage. And so just seeing uh, my freshman year, I was in a version of Stone Soup. So word about it to life, I was uh, hooked. And so she offered an intro playwriting course. And I wrote my very first play. It was a theater for young audiences script called Twilight Wood. (laughs) Um, about a brother and sister who get lost in the woods and meet fairies and other assorted creatures. And um, then, of course, there was the Horizon Young Playwrights Festival. And uh, I've just been dabbling in it ever since. Cool. That's awesome. Um, And so so how did you get into creating visual art? Oh, wow. Pretty much since I was little. Um, as my mom tells me, I've always liked painting, drawing, making messes. Um, <laughs> and in elementary school, I had this wonderful art teacher. I, it all goes back to elementary school. You know, Her that, name was that comes up a lot, like in, yeah. in the podcast, like different artists, everybody has like some story about like a teacher or like, mm-hmm. you know, just, just learning, you know, they're like what they loved when they were kids, you know? Yeah. So in elementary school, I had this really great art teacher, you know, as you do, and her name was Miss White, and she was everything that I thought an artist should be. She was uh, funky, she was loud and spoke her opinions. Um, She had a great style of use of color. She even made her own clothes and wore bright lipstick. And so, you know, to me, that was just very glamorous as a fourth grader. Yeah. And, um, you know, there was no wrong way to do art as long as you were doing the assignment. You know, that is really what stuck with me. Um, and as I grew as an artist, it kind of turned into this feeling that, you know, everybody can do art. You just got to stop comparing yourself. You know, everyone can paint. Dang it. That's like right. my unofficial motto. She just kind of put put that little seed in there um 
that, you know, art classes. I took all of them that I could through middle school and high school. And in high school, my art teacher, we joked that it was a little bit of benign neglect. He'd give us canvases, give us paint and say, go paint something. And that was basically our assignment. As long as we painted something, we made an A in the class. Oh, that's awesome. Yeah. Um, He also let us paint things that were like 10 feet by 12 feet. So. Oh, that's uh, cool. Yeah. We got to make our own canvases. Um, Oh, that's really cool. So yeah, he, he had this source for canvas and I got a little spoiled when I got out to the real world and found out exactly how expensive canvases are. Yeah. (laughs) Um, uh, Which kind of led me to the repurposed materials. Mm -hmm. So that's kind of a shorthand, my creative uh, journey. I didn't really take many art classes in college because I was busy in theater, but I did scenic design and scenic painting. So it was very fun to take visual arts into theater and take theater into visual arts. Right. Yeah. It's, it's, it's all just kind of like a creative circle sometimes. Mm -hmm. So, so you, you know, explored creating art in different mediums, obviously music, theater, visual art, fiction, et cetera. Um, Mm -hmm. So, so, you know, how has exploring different art forms helped you to find your own creative expression? Well, like I said, one kind of feeds into the other. If you look for the connections, I love music. I love playing it. I love listening to it, you know, and to me, the big thing about music is mood. And a lot of times that music will give me an idea for a scene. Uh, So then I write the scene and then something happens in the scene that gives a visual image and so on and so forth. So it doesn't always happen that way, but I've learned to look at the different arts and see what I can get out of it for my other hobbies. Right. That's cool. So do you ever like create art based on something you're writing or write something based on something you're painting? Usually I will do artwork for what I'm writing. I love character uh, art because a lot of my characters are fairy queens and steampunk airship pirates and and things like that that are just fun to draw. Right. I've learned that that's easier with fiction than it is playwriting because, you know, once you've got the script, you got to let it go a little bit, you know, and let the directors and the actors interpret. I never want to be that playwright. That's like, must be this kind of person at this time. Right. Right. Yeah. It's more, it's more collaborative and Exactly. Whereas fiction is more like you're creating the whole world. The whole world and the characters. I, I always like to, when I'm writing fiction, tell myself, okay, you're the playwright, the director, and the actor. All in one. And the right. set designer. So uh, do you still play violin? Oh, yeah. Um, <laughs> here and there. I thought in high school, it, that was a, that brought back some, a little sadness uh, when I was thinking on this question. I, was going to be a music major as I went into high school um, with mm-hmm. a biology minor. Um, that was my plan. I was going to study bugs and play music. Boy, did things change a little bit. <laughs> but in high school, I started having issues with my wrist and hand that basically it hurt too much to play as much as I was going to need to play. So I scaled back. I don't play with any groups right now, but I play for my girls. I play for myself. I had a chance to do school visits for our Wonder Quest productions and teach them, teach the kids coming to see the show about theater etiquette and kind of get them ready for the oh, theater cool. production. Mm-hmm. Music was always my in. You, you play a fiddle tune and kids are hooked. They'll watch you do anything. Right. And it's just fun, you know, that kids don't have the same inhibitions as grownups. Mm-hmm. So, you know, they clap. They don't care if you mess up. They don't know that you messed up. Um, just a little, it's just really fun. Yeah, that, so, that is fun. So once I had my own girls, you know, playing for them has been that same kind of joy. But here lately, because I've been more focused on visual arts and writing, I haven't gotten to play as much as I like to. Yeah. I mean, you know, I understand that that kind of sadness that comes with not being able to, like, do everything. Because, do everything, yes. Right. I mean, I used to be in bands. I used to do the singer-songwriter thing. But I really mm-hmm. haven't been able to, like, do that much musically 
uh, recently because, mm-hmm. you know, I'm, I'm really focused on writing and, and uh, you know, just other creativity. Their pursuits. Yeah. Right. Exactly. So it, it is kind of, kind of sad sometimes. B- but- bittersweet. Right. But then it's like you shift and you change and you grow as an Mm -hmm. artist. So it's like, I feel like there are different mediums or instruments or, you know, whatever it is Um, for like different phases in your life. Yeah. And it never truly goes away. So you can always, you know, revisit when you have time and, you know, when things change. So I've, I've still got my violin. I keep it in good shape and, you know, my fingers still remember. Right. Right. That's cool. That's awesome. I like that. So, so, okay. What, what like inspires you? Are you inspired <laughs> by different things for different art forms or kind of just all the same thing? I think for the most part, music is my biggest inspiration. Again, it goes back to that mood. Mm-hmm. And when I'm writing, mood gets me into the scene. And then I usually have to put it away to get the words to come. Art is definitely music based. Um, I have to have music playing when I'm working Mm -hmm. on a visual, uh, on a painting or a a piece. And it just, I don't know, it just keeps me going. Uh, But I do also, I love other art. Um, I love going to museums and seeing what other people have done, have tried again with that eye of, Ooh, what can I do? That's like that. Ooh, I like the way they did those breaststrokes or, you know, those colors that they used or, oh goodness, they're using bendy straws in a way I've never seen before. So that's definitely an inspiration too. I also like going to theater when I can. Right. It's harder. Hopefully my girls will enjoy going to theater one day. Right now it's a little hard to get away, but you know, spectacle. I love, you know, there hasn't been a lot of theater like in the past year for anyone. (laughs) That's yeah. true. We'll, we'll catch up. I've, I've taken the girls to a few shows and, you know, enjoyed that with them, but just anything with big spectacle. I love music videos. Mm-hmm. I find them very fascinating as an art form, you know, like little tiny mini movies right. when they're done right, when they're not just people dancing around. Um, yeah. <laughs> even though dance is, is very inspiring to um, I work with our dance department and I'm constantly in awe of what they do. Really? I, I guess I get inspiration from a lot of things. I read, but I don't know that that inspires me in the same way. I enjoy it. Right. But I think I read for escapism. So that's much more for that than inspiration. Yeah, I, I know what you mean. Like, I, I read a lot too, but, and I, I feel like the reading I do does inspire me, but I feel like it's more on like a subconscious level. So Mm -hmm. when I start writing, it's like uh, these influences are naturally coming out, but I I don't really consciously think about it, you know? I feel like that's when things start getting, what do they say, derivative? (laughs) Right. (laughs) If if you're taking directly from other things. Right. Yeah. You know, I I try not to do that, but, you know, maybe. Sometimes there's good ideas. Yeah, and- yeah. You know, I mean, sometimes you can do interesting things with like, like if you just set out to like retell, so like a retelling of mm-hmm. like a fairy tale or, so, you know. Turn a like trope that. on its head kind right, of thing. I've, right. re- I've read some really good, good stories that have done that. Yeah. So, okay. So, so what's your process like with creating visual art? So you, you have music. Do you, do you like mm-hmm. pain at any certain time of day? Is there anything well, else that kind of helps you? Well, right now, um, I paint on my lunch breaks, <laughs> <laughs> um, which sounds crazy, but I have trouble focusing for long amounts of time. So like one hour to like get in, get some work done and get out seems mm-hmm. to work really well for me, actually. So I definitely put headphones on if I'm starting a new piece and thumb around my music, my Spotify playlist, you know, all that good stuff till I find something that like strikes me Mm -hmm. like, Ooh, I like that song and give it a listen. And the way my art seems to work these days is that, um, I start with a color or several colors and scumble them together or do more like a watercolor technique uh, and let that dry. Mm -hmm. And then I look at those colors. Usually I don't have any idea. Sometimes I have like a I want to paint a tree that's doing this, but rarely, rarely does that happen. I just look at the colors and go, okay, that looks like a fish or 
I'm going to paint some clouds over that. And once I get that going, it kind of evolves. And sometimes a tree gets added to the clouds or rainbow. I, I kind of feel it out as right. I go. And sometimes I'll have intentions, but that isn't where I end up. As yeah. Bob Ross says, you know, happy little accidents. Um, oh, yeah. Uh, no, I love Bob Ross. He's like my guru. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yeah, I think happy little accidents is the best way to sum up my visual art style. Yeah, I, yeah. I mean, I, I've tried painting a little. I don't really have like, you know, the Bob Ross skills, but, but oh, uh, yeah. you know, I've, I've dabbled here and there. And it's just mm-hmm. for me, it's like you just kind of let it flow and, and just see where mm-hmm. it takes you and. You know, that's kind of how my writing process is, too, really. Mm -hmm. I I like to call it playing. Um, I feel like that's a word that grownups don't use enough. Right, Um, right. I like to play with the paint. And I come out with it on my face and my hands. Like, (laughs) I often have to bring a change of clothes to work sometimes, uh, Mm -hmm. depending on what I'm working on, if it involves spattering. Yeah, playing, playing with the color, playing with the ideas till something kind of comes together. Yeah, no, that's cool. So, okay, which which art form makes you feel the most vulnerable to share? Or, you know, do you feel vulnerable, like, at all with any of them? The one that is hardest for me to share that makes me feel the most vulnerable is actually playwriting. Uh, mm-hmm. I get so in my head about... Now, I've only ever had... One play, Twilight Wood, was performed at a summer camp that I directed, which is, you know, very different than watching somebody else direct your work. Um, Right. Well, my newly retitled Upon the Wind's Tide that used to be The Grand Adventures of Henry Rain and the Airship Pirates um, was done as a costume stage reading um, at a festival that we put together. And I sat there. They did a wonderful job. It was great. But I sat there with, like, my hands over my face and my legs all knotted up. And I was just terrified that everybody was going to hate it. Mm -hmm. I don't know why. And I felt so emotionally vulnerable in that moment. Nobody was paying attention to me. They were busy enjoying my play, but like that was the hardest to sit in a room full of other people listening to my words. (laughs) Yeah, I get that because I, I mean, it's like, fiction you you are vulnerable but like you don't see people reading it <laughs> exactly it's a private thing <laughs> right right or even just like painting you know you're not always necessarily there when people are yes your work now I've got a artist reception coming up at the beginning of October that I will get my first taste of being there while people look at my artwork <laughs> So I'll touch base with you and let you know how I feel about that. But right now, yeah, the art is very, very much removed. Although I have done some craft shows where watching people kind of come up and look at your stuff, make faces, and then like, hey, they decided to purchase it or, oh, they walked away. You know, it has a little bit of that vulnerability, but still not the same as that night in the theater with my play being (laughs) performed. Yeah, no, I, I totally understand what you're saying. But, you know, I think all artists feel that, you know, sense of, of being vulnerable, like, to some mm-hmm. extent. And, and I feel like the more you feel that and the more, like, risks you take, the that's kind of when exciting things can happen, at least for me. Yeah, no, I agree with that because it means you've put emotions into it. You've put yourself into it. You know, if if you're feeling that anxious about it, I I definitely get that. Right. And, you know, it it does get easier, like the more you do it. That's true. I need I need to get back on the playwriting horse and get some of my scripts out there. Yeah, definitely. Um, So speaking of playwriting, is is your Mm -hmm. your process with writing plays very different from your process with writing fiction or how does that work? Well, I don't think it's really too different just because I came to serious writing through playwriting first. And so I think my fiction writing is colored by that. And I tend to structure my fiction very similarly, like act one, act two chapters are more like scenes. Uh, And so the process, I usually end up with world building first 
it's funny. My art process is so like, wow, all over the place. But my writing <laughs> process, I have to outline. I jot down, brainstorm, world building ideas, uh, fill up notebooks. But when it comes to actually writing, mm-hmm. I can I can't, I can't pants it. I have right. to have an outline. And I enjoy the outlining process because I like working from the big picture down to the minutia. Mm-hmm. And I like to know where my story is going to go, like how it's going to end. And that seems to carry from playwriting to fiction pretty seamlessly, that, right. that part of the process. Yeah, that, that's interesting that you're pretty much like a pantser when it comes to like painting, but not at all when it comes to writing. That's, that's interesting. I know. I've, I've pondered. I have a 30-minute commute and my brain gets going. And I'm like, why? I don't know <laughs> why my brain works in two different directions. Right. Yeah, I mean, it, it, kind of, it makes sense to me, though. So, so what's, what is your process like when, when you're writing like a micro fiction or flash fiction? I totally got into micro fiction because I had what I called deleted scenes from Mm -hmm. my stories or my plays, stuff that like was character development that didn't make sense to be in the big story, but I wanted to write it anyways. Right. And so I, I, I like to zero in on small moments in time between characters. It's usually character driven. Mm -hmm. The flash fiction, because it's shorter is usually what I call my inside jokes. Like, Nobody ever, hardly ever reads that because it's my characters doing something silly or ridiculous that only I get because I created them. Right. So I like, I like to also just take my characters and go, what if, bam, three paragraphs to figure that out. So I don't know if that's a typical process for micro or flash fiction, but that tends to be what, what mine is. Yeah, no, I I haven't really tried to write that much microfiction. Like I I think I wrote one piece in in a writing like class that was it was mm-hmm. kind of like a writing exercise. So like we only had a certain amount of time and uh-huh. that's kind of what just naturally happened, but like I don't know. I, I for me I feel like it would be a similar process to writing poetry like where it's just like one moment, you know. Yes, I was actually going to say the flash fiction that I've written, I've been able to be more abstract than I feel like I should be in my regular fiction writing, uh, which I like that. But experimentation with language is there right. without quite being as far as poetry. Right. That's that's cool. Yeah. So it gives you kind of gives you more freedom in that way. Mm hmm. So uh, so you have your Etsy store. Um, so has selling your creations like changed your creative process at all? Not really, just because I'm probably like the world's worst Etsy seller. Um, (laughs) I'm terrible at doing shop updates and promotions and I'm working on that. But that's the the sort of structured focused part of being an artist that I struggle with. Mm -hmm. I did go through some time when I was trying to make things for the market and they weren't selling. And so gave that up and went back to my weird ways and realized that my art is fine. Instead of trying to please the crowd that I'm with, go find a crowd that likes what I like to do. So it's been a little challenging because Cleveland is a small town and I love it dearly, but it's just a very different atmosphere as to like what people like in arts and crafts versus Athens or Buford or Atlanta. And then there's the distance, you know, selling artwork in Atlanta is great, except then you have to drive two hours and set up and all that. Right. So once I realized that if I find my audience and make a commitment to doing it that way, people like my stuff. And so that was kind of freeing. Like, I don't have to make stuff that people will buy. I just have to find the people to buy my stuff. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I like that. Like, because I mean, I think I feel like there's there's always somebody out there that will appreciate what you're doing. And you just Mm -hmm. you just have to find those people. Yep. And the Internet has definitely made that easier. Oh, Uh, yeah. Actually, actually do a pretty decent job keeping up with my um, my Instagram and and contacts that way. I have Mm -hmm. a minuscule following in the grand scheme of social media, but I just. I do it to put it out there and the people who like it, like it. I haven't gotten too aggressive 
with that because it'll happen as it needs to happen. Right. Yeah. If if you get really caught up in like, you know, the numbers, for likes and followers and, and I mean, I, I've definitely done that before. And it's just like it gets very distracting, you know. It gets distracting and depressing and then you're not making art because you're worried about numbers and people just want to see your art. Right. Yeah. And then you compare yourself to other people a lot, Oof. which is just like, yes, you know, that's a way to kill creativity, really. <laughs> Real fast, for yeah. sure. So how is the collaboration process between you and your husband when creating craft goods? Well, it has worked out really well in that he is a phenomenal woodworker and he's creative and artistic in his own way with, with the woodworking. Mm -hmm. And I like to paint things. So our motto for a while was built strong, painted pretty. And that just kind of covered, you know, like any relationship, working relationship or otherwise, you know, we've had some disagreements about how things should look or, or things like that, but we've, we've Mm -hmm. figured out a compromise Um, But really, our skill sets complement each other so well. He is very aware of how things should look in the end. And he's the one who always set up our tables at the craft shows in the beginning because he's very meticulous about how things would look and the merchandising. Right. Um, He also has a great eye for detail. He spent one of the craft things we make is uh, toy swords and shields and daggers because we like all of that stuff. So we wanted to make some. Mm -hmm. He spent time researching actual historical galladiums and German swords and knight swords to draw his inspiration from. And it just really shows through. And, you know, we built birdhouses for a while. We did all the research about the size of the holes. Um, And it just helps keep me grounded Mm -hmm. since I'm all over the place. You know, he, he kind of helps us get a plan together when we'd have a craft show going. And I I think we just kind of click. Yeah. It sounds like you guys, you know, complement each other pretty well. And uh, I do also have to say he has got a YouTube channel, so he does filming and stuff as well, which I have never wanted to do. Oh, cool. The YouTube, YouTube channel is called making sawdust. Uh, so if anyone wants to go see him make some of our craft stuff and good DIY projects for your house, you should go check that out. Yeah, um, I'll, de- I'll definitely link to that on findcreativeexpression.com as well. Okay. Well, and just that same meticulousness that he brings to the projects, like the video editing and all of that, it just constantly amazes me. Mm-hmm. <laughs> The videos you see on my Instagram are me lip syncing to Vanilla Ice's Ninja Rap. Like that's the extent (laughs) of my video making. Well, that could be fun too, though, you know? (laughs) It's true. It fits for me. (laughs) Yeah, yeah. So so what are you working on right now? Well, uh, I just found out this weekend that I am going to be showing my artwork at Chesmu Cellars in Marietta. For the month of September, a high school friend uh, reached out and she said, hey, we're looking for an artist. Do you think you have, you know, 10 to 12 pieces you'd want to show? And I'm like, I can make 10 to 12 pieces by August 31st. (laughs) Uh, So that's kind of my big focus. Most of it is done, but I've got three to four big pieces that I would like to finish up in the next couple of weeks to be able to to show. Um, Writing wise... I'm, this is, this was my COVID quarantine project that Mm. I was going to take my play upon the wind's tide that just struggles so hard to be a play. It really wants to be a novel. (laughs) It's three acts and 120 pages. It's, it's massive. So I was like, you know, I'm going to write 200 words a day and write it into a novel. That way my steampunk world can have its, you know, full world building. So very slow going, but it's just, for fun, really, seen at a time, 200-ish words a day. That's cool. Yeah, and it can, I feel like it can really um, be, like, an interesting exercise to just adapt something from play mm-hmm. form to fiction or fiction to play form. 
Because it's like it, it forces you it forces you to kind of look at something through a different lens, you know. Yep. So, uh, so what books or TV shows or music are you really into right now? Well, I've really okay. So I'm a big fan of Spotify. Uh, I have way too many overly curated playlists. Um, but I found that recently when I paint music with heavy bass beats. I've always been into electronic music since uh, Tiesto back in the late 90s. Mm -hmm. Um, But there's, I think it's just called Big Beats. It's And it's all this, it still moves, but it's got this heavy, heavy bass beat to it. Um, Like the propeller heads, um, the lobby scene from The Matrix, um, that kind of stuff that's like action movie music, Mm -hmm. um, but a little heavier. And I definitely hopped on the Loki bandwagon. Uh, We watched (laughs) all of that. Um, I'm actually working on a Sylvie costume for Halloween. Uh, Oh, cool. Yes, dark blonde hair. I can do that. Um, (laughs) I don't have to dye my hair. So I'm not a seamstress by any means, but I do have fun working on simple, fun costumes like that. Right. And then reading, I've actually done more reading this year than I have done in many years. Um, I've got, this is going to sound so strange, but I've got three series that I'm reading. Um, I finally got through Dune and actually enjoyed it. And then I read Hyperion, which is another science fiction from the 80s. I can't even begin to describe it. It's so expansive. Um, And then (laughs) Carry On by Rainbow Rowell. Oh, right. I love that book. (laughs) <laughs> yeah, it, I'm like, ooh, fluff. So I've read the first books in these series, and now I'm about to go back. I'm almost done with Carry On, and I'm going to read Dune Messiah, Hyperion, Falls, and then, is it Wayward Sons is the next one in Rainbow Row? So, uh, I, you know, I don't know. I, I haven't actually read that one. I, I'll read it and let you know. <laughs> yeah, your name. Uh, awesome. So that's been kind of a weird sequence of reading, but... Um, I've enjoyed all of those books. Right. That's cool. Yeah. I've been reading a lot more lately as well. Um, I don't, I just, it goes kind of in phases for me sometimes. Like Mm -hmm. I'll I'll go like a few months without reading anything and then I'll read like three books in like three weeks, you know? So Mm -hmm. for me, I only get to read at bedtime. So it's how many pages can I get through before I fall asleep? (laughs) Right, right. Yeah, I do a lot of audiobooks. I wish I could, because I drive an hour a day, but the stories don't stick oh, in yeah. audio format. But I, I just, in one ear and out the other. Oops. Yeah, but. not not everyone is like a, you know, can, can process things in that way. Uh, okay, so I have kind of a big question that I ask mm-hmm. everyone on the podcast. Uh, why do you think art is important? Well, I think art is important because it allows us to play and kind of takes takes you back to a time when you have less inhibitions. Like when you get swept up in music or a visual piece of art, you get to forget that you're a grown up, mm-hmm. which I feel like if more grown ups took a few hours a week to forget they were grown ups, they could be less grumpy about things. Um <laughs> And I, I feel like, well, I feel like playing is important for everybody. But I also think that art is a language without borders, mm-hmm. that it, it crosses borders when words don't work, um, whether it's music or visual art. We can all look at something and have feelings, whether or not we speak the same language. And I think that unifying thing about art is, needs to be put out there, you know, that if we can come together with art or music, uh, that maybe we can figure out how to come together about other issues. Right, right. I have a lot of different, like, friends with a lot of different, you know, beliefs, and uh, it seems like they can all kind of agree on on just loving art. I mean, maybe it's not the same art, but it's like, you can always connect with someone over yeah. that experience. Or, you know, that you're all looking at the Mona Lisa, 
Mm-hmm. And you're all having a feeling of some kind. Like that's what I love. It's kind of the same thing about theater. You've got, you know, a hundred strangers in a room. They don't know each other, but they're all having feelings, you know, of some kind. And I like that. Right. Right. That's really cool. So uh, where can people find you and your work? Okay. So my visual art um, is on Instagram. If you look up Lunar Cat Paper Company, as far as I know, I'm the only one on there with that handle. So it should be pretty easy to find. Um, Like I said, you can find my husband's work um, on Making Sawdust on YouTube. And then Lunar Cat Paper Company is also on Etsy and I'm, I'm working so hard on a big shop update for my birthday in September. So hopefully there'll be some new fun stuff. Original artwork, prints, more stickers. I love stickers uh, and all that good stuff. Awesome. That sounds really cool. Yeah, I, I can link to all of that on the website as well. So just okay. go to findcreativeexpression.com and check out Lamey's art. Yeah. Okay. Well, yeah. Thanks so much for coming on the podcast. That that was great. That was a lot of fun. Yay. I really enjoyed talking to Lainey and I hope you enjoyed it as well. Coming up in the next episode, I'm going to be doing a kind of best of the find creative expression podcast episode where I just kind of reflect on the conversations that I've had in the first year I've already started working on it, and I'm really excited about it, so I hope you'll listen to that. Thank you so much for listening, and I will catch you in the next one. Thanks for listening to the Find Creative Expression podcast. Please leave the podcast a review on your favorite podcast platform so that other people can find us as well. Thanks so much for supporting the podcast, supporting indie artists, and I'll see you in two weeks for the next episode. 